Welcome to the Evangelism Podcast. I'm Daniel King and I'm excited about telling people about Jesus. And today I have a great friend with me, Dr. Buddy Bell. Thank you so much for joining me on the Evangelism Podcast. Good to be here, Daniel. Well, you and I have been friends for quite a while now. And the thing that I love about your ministry is that you love helping churches help people. Amen. And building the helps ministry. So tell me, how did you get started in helping churches build their helps ministry? Well, I think the big thing was uh, realizing uh, that I was in the ministry of helps. You know, my wife and I were involved in church and, and uh, back then no one had ever heard of the ministry of helps. And uh, we were, uh, you know, people would say we were strange. We were weird, we were different. They told us, you know, God broke the mold uh, when he made us. And I remember one day uh, in church on Sunday morning, my pastor at that time opened up the first Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And uh, he began to read it, it says, and God has set some in the church. And I thought, well, you know, that's where I wanna be. I wanna be in church. I just don't wanna go to church. And uh, it goes on, it says, first apostles, Secondly, prophets, thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, and then he said, helps, and he stopped. And for 60 seconds, he expounded on the ministry of helps. And I sat there in church with tears in my eyes, and I said to myself, you know, buddy, you're not weird, you're not strange, you're not different. God didn't break the mold when he made you, but the mold is still in the Bible. And I found my place that day in church. I was in the ministry of helps. And, uh, and so that began to, you know, develop on the inside of me. I be began to, uh, s you know, seek more information on the ministry of helps. And because, you know, like one minister said to me, you know, people want to see their place in the Bible. You know, am I on the team? Or am I just sitting in the uh, uh, grandstand watching the game? People want to be in the game. You know, am I really important? You know, my, my greatest reward, I guess, uh, traveling and teaching on the Ministry of Helps is, and I'll never forget her, this nursery worker walked up to me and she had tears running down her cheeks and she, she said, you know, Brother Bell, I really didn't think God knew I was back there in their nursery. And I'll never forget her. And, you know, and, and people think that, well, you know, I, I just work in the nursery or I'm just an usher or I'm just a, a greeter or I, I just do what pastor wants done. And they don't realize how valuable and how important they are. I mean, if it wasn't important, then why did God that created the heavens and the earth set into the church helps? You know, there, there's a rumor going around the world today that, that Buddy Bell made up this ministry of helps. I didn't make it up. I read my Bible, you know, and I, and I see I have a part in the body of Christ. I'm valuable. I'm important. You know, the definition, now if I get preaching, we're going to take an offering, <laughs> okay? But the definition for the ministry of helps, is the Greek definition, it says one of the ministrations in the local church by way of rendering assistance or especially of help minister to the weak and the needy. So if you're rendering assistance in any way in the church, if you're giving help to the weak and the needy, you're operating in this supernatural ministry, the ministry of helps. Now listen to me. It's a ministry is just as valid, just as anointed as if God had asked you to be a prophet. I think I heard an amen out there. Amen. Maybe a couple amens out there. Amen. Why? Because God is not a respecter. We're in this thing together. You know, I thank God for prophets, but also thank God for nursery workers and ushers and greeters. You know, I've, <laughs> I've had people, when I get done ministering on helps, will uh, take me off to the side. I don't know how many times this happened. And they say, now, brother, buddy, I want to ask you a question, but I want you to be honest with me. Like I've been lying to them the whole time, you know. And they, but I want you to be honest, nobody's around, you know, but you're really not that excited 
about nursery workers, are you? I say, excuse me, I'm going to back up. The wrath of God is coming in here. You know, and, and I see it on people's faces when I'm teaching on the ministry of helps. You know, do, do, do you really believe that, brother, buddy? Well, let, let me help you out. When I look at a nursery worker, I don't see a nursery worker. I see Jesus. When I look at an usher, I don't see an usher. I see Jesus. When I look at a prophet, I don't see a prophet. I see Jesus. And that's why I can be excited about every member and every part of the body because I'm excited about Jesus. Amen. All right. I'm Amen. Gonna let you do some. Well, I think your perspective is so valuable because sometimes when people think about being in ministry, the picture that comes to mind is the fivefold ministry gifts. You got the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, and they envision a platform ministry where someone's up on the platform. And, and a lot of people are actually scared to do public speaking or get on a platform. They, so they say to themselves, oh, I could never be in ministry. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that you can totally be in ministry by finding a place to serve in the house of God. Amen. And by helping out with what needs to be done because the pastor is not the only one called to serve the Lord. Every single believer can find a place to help in the body of Christ. Amen. Would you say you that's know, true? Daniel, you used a word just a moment ago that I don't use, okay? And because it's a word that causes division within the body, and that word is fivefold. I don't believe in the fivefold. Okay, yeah, you can't find it in the Bible, that word, you know. And so I tell people, I'm in the sevenfold. Now I've got you on that one because seven is God's number. And what's the other two? Helps in governments. Well, then that don't leave anybody out, okay? And so I, I don't use that word fivefold, okay? And because when you said it, you know, there was a division there. You had a group that was up on the platform and then the rest of the of us over here, you know, we all want, we're all, we're all in this together, you know, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I just don't use that word. <laughs> all right, well, I will uh, amend my vocabulary. Yeah. And, and I actually agree with you. I, I think helps is a, an extremely valuable ministry in the church. All right, so let's say you, you go into a church right. and you're, you're helping their helps ministry challenging people to serve the Lord with excellence. I've heard you talk some about King Solomon and the excellence that his helpers serve the Lord with. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, when the Queen of Sheba and from Ethiopia visited him, you know, uh, I point out the things that she noticed, okay? And, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times we don't realize uh, when people walk into the church, that they see things, and they're moved by what they see, okay? She was moved by what she saw. She saw the food, uh, the, the, the meat on the table. She saw her, the building. Uh, she saw the uh, ministers and their apparel, the cupbearers and their apparel, the way he carried himself in, up into the house of the Lord. You know, 85% of communication is done through body expression. You know, you ever had anybody ask you, hey, what's wrong? And they go, well, uh, nothing. Well, you need to tell your face because your face is telling everybody that there's something wrong, you know. And so, you know, I, I talk about ushers that they affect people's giving by the way they, they come down the aisle with the buckets, you know. Uh, some of them look like they're in a funeral, you know. If an usher is me, no one wants to put anything in that offering bucket. <laughs> right. Here, throw, put, your, right. put your offering in there. Right. And, and, and some do that. Some think, well, maybe we shouldn't be taking an offering right now. They don't have to say nothing. You can see it. You know, when a pastor has to coax them to come down for the offering. Okay, we're, we're going to have an offering here. Uh, okay, you know, God loves a cheerful giver, a hilarious giver. Uh, we're going to need some ushers. Uh, ushers, uh, Fred, uh, come on down, Fred. Come on, Fred. You, you can help out. You know, it, it, like we're trying to coax them in, into giving, okay, when they ought to come down with a smile on their face. Well, Daniel, how come they don't smile when they come down? I'll tell you why. They're not givers themselves. I wouldn't have a non-giving person as an usher in the church. 
Actually, I wouldn't have a non-tither as an usher. What, what, what an honor to stand up and say, now we're getting ready to take the offering and these people that are serving as ushers, they're all tithers in the church. Wow. You know, I had, had one usher said to me, well, you better not look at the, at the giving records, you know, if I'm a tither or not. I said, listen, sheep are not dumb. I said, we don't need to look at the records to see if you're a tither or not. We have our ways of finding out. You know, when we're down at IHOP afterwards, you know, we'll bring up tithing and notice how quick you change the subject. So we, we, we don't need to look at the books. We're all in this together. We all have a part. We're all, we're all valuable. We're all important. The ushers, the greeters. I've seen people get saved at the door when they walked in. I saw this one gentleman, when the greeter reached out to grab him, he fell on his knees and said, my God, I need Jesus. Well, doesn't he know he's got to wait till the end of the service? That's when we give the altar calls at the end. You know, the first church I was involved in, our attitude in the ministry of helps us. We're going to get everybody saved, everybody healed, everybody set free before church. And if we miss any of them, pastor can pick, pick them up at the end. But a lot of churches is, well, let's see how many pastor can pick up at the end. You know, where we, you know, where we were, we were evangelizing at the door and the nursery, you know, um, uh, I tell a story. You're going to get me going on the stories here. Uh, a mother uh, came to the nursery and uh, worker and said, uh, I just want to know something. What did you do to my baby last Sunday? I, 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 when I picked up my, my baby and I took her home and I put her in, the, in her bed, she immediately went to sleep. She never goes immediately to sleep. What did you do to my baby? And so the, the nursery worker had an opportunity to share Jesus with her. She went out front at, at, in the service, and at the end she raised her hand and got saved. Now, was it the sermon or was it the, the nursery worker that realized this is not a babysitting service back here, but this is a ministry. And she ministered to that mother that morning, and that's why she got saved. Yeah, when you think about a new visitor who comes to a church, uh -huh. he drives into the parking lot, he sees the parking lot attendant, mm -hmm. helps him park his car, then he walks in the front door, there's a greeter there, mm -hmm. and then an usher helps the person to find a seat. Maybe if they have kids, they go drop their kids off at the nursery or mm -hmm. in the children's ministry, so they're looking around trying to figure out where they're supposed to take their kids. Yeah. Finally, they, they get in, they're, the, the usher helps them find a seat, and uh, people are there and, and say, hey, that's my seat. I sat in that pew every Sunday. What are you doing sitting in my seat? Right. But, and then uh, somebody greets the crowd, and then you have the praise and worship team get up, and then yeah. maybe someone uh, receives the offering. And you can be 30, 40 minutes into the church service before they ever see the pastor, hear the pastor, and probably by that time they've already decided whether they like the church or not, whether that would be the type of church that they would want to be a member at. Right. The experts say that uh, first-time visitors will determine within the first six to seven minutes if they're going to return or not to that church. And who do they meet in the first six or seven minutes? They Usually meet, not the pastor. Yeah. They He's meet, back there in the, the <laughs> green room on his face before God praying, yeah, probably. Yeah. They meet, they meet the parking lot attendant who, uh, uh, park it over here, uh, stay between the lines, uh, grab your kids' hands. We need speed bumps out here. Nursery, I don't know where the nursery's at. Find somebody has got a baby and follow them. And then they walk in and they see the greeter, you know, uh, shake hands with the people in front of them there and hug them. But when they walk to the door, the, the greeter just happened to turn and not shake their hand or greet them, you know. And then they go on down the hall and they go to the nursery after they find it, you know. And the nursery worker looks at him and said, oh, no, and not another one. Man, I need some help back here. I hope you brought some clean diapers. I mean, you know, some people bring their babies in here and they don't bring extra diapers and they expect us to supply them extra diapers. And then they, they leave there and they, they go down to the, the youth room and uh, the youth leader comes out and said, oh, you're new. 
Well, uh, let me explain some things that go on down here in the youth ministry. Uh, we cast out devils down here. And if your little boy's got a devil, we will cast it out of him. And then they come on down the hall and, and they walk into the sanctuary. Now, I'm talking about typical churches, okay? And they walk in the sanctuary and the ushers and the elders are holding up the back wall. You know, for six days and six nights, the back wall stands by itself. But it becomes a seventh day. It takes all the ushers and all the elders to hold up the back wall, you know. And they just say, well, just just find a chair somewhere, you know. And so they go, they, they sit down, you know. And, uh, and then they watch the, the worship team and the, and the uh, musicians. They're up there arguing which song they're going to sing. Now, would you go back to that church? Would you go back to that church? Not that church. No. Actually, I'd probably preach to that church one time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in a lot of those churches. You know, I, I have. I've been in a lot of those churches. But what, what if they walk in or drive into the parking lot and the parking lot attendant's out there. He's got a smile on his face. He welcomes them to the church, you know, and it says, hey, you know, the door is right over here. You know, the greeters are right there. They'll help you if you got questions. They'll show you where all where your children need to go. And the greeters there got a smile on their face. You know, they find out they're new. See, greeters should be walking information booths, you know. So they take that family and they take them down to the nursery. They introduce them to the nursery worker and let them know that they're new here, you know. Then they take them down to Children's Church and they let them know that they're new. And then they take them up to the sanctuary and tell the usher, these, these people are new. Well, knowing that, the usher is going to make sure that they have a real good seat up front so they can see everything, hear everything that God wants them. For them to hear, you know, tells them more about the church, tells them to get excited. You know, our pastor's been in the word, he's been teaching this series. I mean, it's really the people are really excited. Now you tell me, you gonna come back to that church? That sounds like a great church to go to. And there are churches like that. There yeah. are churches that like that. And uh and so uh And so when you go into a church and mm -hmm. they've asked you to to help their ushers, help their greeters. What are some of the things that you say to them to, to help them to be the very best ushers and greeters and ministers that they can be? Well, the most important thing, again, is to show them and teach them about the ministry of helps. Once, you know, it's hard to uh, teach someone something if they don't realize how important it is and they are. Okay, and so you know the, the the very first thing is to teach them, you know, the importance of the ministry of helps, but also, you know, I'm not just there for people that are serving, but the leaders need to understand it. Okay, people never go beyond their leadership. However, the leadership is in the church, that's the way the people will be. You know, a, a lot of times it, it's not the people's fault. You know, uh, uh, pastor said, well, I can't get anybody involved. Well, my first question is, uh, uh, let me talk to your leaders. Do they believe in the ministry of helps? You know, do they realize how valuable uh, the people are? You know, that their ministry is a, is a supernatural ministry. Do they understand that? You know, and so I, I always say, let me talk to your leaders, you know, let me let me minister to your leaders and show to them how valuable the ministry of helps is and that it's an important ministry, you know, and they need to get that across. You know, <laughs> you uh, I had a, uh, a minister years ago when I was young and uh, he asked me, he said, Brother Bell, you ever listen to yourself preach? I said, oh, no, 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 no. He says, you need to listen to yourself preach. There's two attitudes in preaching. There's a want-to attitude and a have-to attitude. He says, we all know we have to. He said, but Brother Bell, what's missing in people is the want-to. You know, we tell them you have to be saved. You have to, you know, uh, uh, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, you, you have to, you have to, you have to. When we ought to be saying that, no, you want to get saved. 
You want Jesus in your life. You want to serve God, not you have to serve God. You know, no, you want to serve God. You want to be every everything that God wants you to be. You want to do all that God wants you to do. And, and that's what's missing with a lot of people. And so, you know, that's one of my main goals when I go into a church, you know, is put the want to back into people because they all they've been hearing is the have to. You know, when I go to a church, I guarantee a pastor, I guarantee him that 10% of the people that are in front of me will step out and want to serve God that have never served God before. I guarantee it. It happens everywhere I go. If there's a thousand people in front of me, over a hundred will come forward that'll want to serve God. People want to serve God. And you'll never talk me out of this. Every Christian, every Christian, deep in their heart, desires to serve God. But they've never been told, you know, that cleaning the church, uh, being a greeter, being an usher, going on an evangelism trip with Daniel King Ministries, you know, and carrying your bags, you know, helping to set up the, the music, uh, the sound, you know, at, at your meetings. It's a ministry. It's a ministry is just as important as you standing up there and ministering the gospel of those people. Because if you had to go and do everything that you just did that happened in your trip in Ethiopia, you wouldn't have done it. You, you, you couldn't have done it, okay? But you had a lot of people around you, a lot of people doing other things, you know, and they weren't in front of the people, okay? But they're valuable and they're important, you know. Every member, every part of the body, you know, no matter where it is, Okay, you know, uh, if I was to reach inside of you right now and pull out a part of you and showed it to you, you know how you would react? You would react like some people, some people react when they see people that walk in the church. Oh no, what's that? You know, where did that come from? But if I told you it came from you, what would be your first response? I need that. Right. Put it back. Put that liver back. I need right. that liver. Yeah, you didn't ask. Me, yeah, but you didn't ask me what it was. You didn't ask me how important it was. You didn't ask me how it helped other parts of my body. But when you found out that it was part of you, all you knew was it must be there for a reason. It must be there for a purpose. And that's the way everybody is in church. You're there for a reason. You're there for a purpose. Maybe I don't understand you. Okay. I don't realize right now how important you are, but you're part of the body, and I need every part of the body. Yeah, when we were just in Ethiopia, one of the most important team members we had was, was um, someone who was just taking pictures. Yeah. Because without those pictures, you can't tell the story back home of everything that, that God did. And so I had a, a wonderful man of God who came and and he was just serving, taking pictures. And uh -huh. he had never taken pictures before, but I put a camera in his hands and said, God can use you. And he, he captured some good ones. And then thinking about Ethiopia, they traced their spiritual heritage back to the Queen of Sheba. Yeah. And so the, the fact that to this day in Ethiopia, there are people that credit their spiritual heritage all the way back to the impression that the Queen of Sheba had with the, the people that attended to King Solomon. It shows the importance of the Ministry of Helps. Yeah, when I was, uh, my teaching that I do called Winning First Time Visitors, and I talk about the Queen of Sheba and everything that she noticed, you know, and uh, while she was there, there was a, a young lady that was sitting on the front row. I was in San Francisco and she was really into this teaching. I, she was saying amen. She was rocking back and forth in her chair, you know. And so when I got done, she walks up to me and uh, she says, Brother Buddy, uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but I was really into your teaching day. I said, well, yeah, it was pretty noticeable. She says, you know why? I said, no, why? I am from Ethiopia. And the Queen of Sheba was responsible for bringing the teachings of God to our country. And that's why I got all excited about that. Amen. But I, I, I teach that. I go into a church to show everybody just how valuable and how important they are. Let me uh, see if we can find it here. 
somewhere in my Bible. I like your Bible. It's full of marks all over the place. You know what they say. <laughs> dirty Bible, clean living. Clean Bible, dirty living. Yeah, but I, I, I want to, it's falling apart. Now, I'm wanting to go get a new Bible. And, uh, uh, but it's all marked up, you know. And, uh, you know, so I don't know what I'm going to do. But, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I tell people this. Now, I, I say this, curiosity is the number one evangelism tool in a local church. People think that they've got, you know, people say, well, you know, I, I, I can't get people to come to church. Well, you just told me something. You don't talk about your church outside of the four walls. I said, you know, you don't have to preach to people to get them to come to church. You don't have to quote scripture. You don't have to act spiritual around. Just talk about your church. Talk about what's going on, what God is doing in your church. Because sooner or later, their curiosity is going to peak. Okay? And, and what's, what happens to them, the same thing that happened to the Queen of Sheba. She says, how be it I believe not their words until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me, for thou exceeded the fame that I had heard. So somebody was talking outside of the four walls, you know. And she, she, she said, well, I just got to go see it with my own eyes. But there was something else that she experienced, okay, while she was there that she would not have experienced if she hadn't went. She says, happy are thy men. And happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, they hear thy wisdom. The spirit of the place touched her. Even though she saw all these different things, okay, it was the spirit that was, everybody was happy. And then she said, blessed be the Lord thy God. Now I tell people she got saved. Now I know nobody can get saved in the Old Testament, but it's a type in the shadow of the new. She said, there is a God. Now, I don't believe an unsaved person should have to go to church five or six times to realize that there is a God. They can realize it in their very first visit, just like the Queen of Sheba. And then she makes this statement, this confession. She says, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee that set thee on his throne to be king for the Lord thy God, because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, many king over them do judgment and justice. What a statement from a first-time visitor. There is a God. You're a man of God. This is the house of God. God's hand is upon you in her first visit. And I've seen that happen with other people that they it just when they walked in and just realized there is a God. But what would happen if they had to go through that parking lot attendant that was grumpy, the greeter that didn't greet them, the nursery worker that told them off, the, the usher that looked at, looked at them like, what are you doing here? You the think, usher that didn't ush. Yeah, right. You think they, that, that there is a God in Israel? And then she writes a check for $130 million and dropped it in the bucket. I tell churches, you need money? There's no telling how many Queen of Sheba's have walked into your church. Could have wrote you one check and paid for everything. But they thought, you know, it's kind of like this. I ask people that, that invest in stock. Do you just randomly pick a stock and invest in it? No. You, you, you find out about that company. And if you're going to invest a lot of money, you go and you visit that, that company. You want to meet the employees. You want to meet the, 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 the up in the office area, you know, the executives. Because you're getting ready to put a bunch of money into that. Well, the same way in church. Some people wonder why people aren't giving. Well, because they... This don't look like a good company to invest in. Yeah. Now you got me preaching. <laughs> well, you've written some great books on the ministry of helps, on ushering, on greeting, just different ways to, to help churches with the, the helps ministry. And on your website, you also have some 
online courses that mm-hmm. can help uh, train churches in these different areas. They could sit all their ushers and greeters down and they yep. can go through some of your material. And uh, you've also traveled and spoken at over 3,000 churches, which yeah. is an amazing statistic, yeah. helping a lot of different churches from every different type of denomination. So if someone wants to find out more about you, they want to buy one of your books, go through one of your courses, or maybe even invite you to come to their church, mm-hmm. what is your website that they can find out more information okay. about you? Well. They can, uh, number one, they could type in Buddy Bell in any search engine. Okay, it'll come up. Uh, you know, I did that earlier. Some baseball player yeah, came up. Yeah, me and the baseball player. Yeah. People always ask me, are you Buddy Bell the baseball player? I said, no, give me a dollar. You know, <laughs> I tell everybody, you got to give me a dollar if you think I'm Buddy Bell the baseball player. And he has four daughters, and I have four daughters, you know. I, w- I wonder if people ever ask him, are you Buddy Bell the preacher? You know, but... Uh, my, yeah, so type in Buddy Bell, right. the Ministry of Helps. And right, come yeah, right you can do that, yeah. Or go to mohi.org. That stands for Ministry of Helps International.org. Or Buddy Bell Ministries, okay? And, uh, you know, I went 21 years straight every weekend for 21 years. Wow, and, uh, that's I, amazing. I've never written a letter. I've never called a pastor cold turkey and asked for a meeting. Never. And they still keep coming in. You know, Fred Price said something one time at at Bible school. He says, you know, if you've got a word from God, God will open the doors. I remember sitting there thinking, oh, come on now. How are they going to know unless I hound them on the phone, you know? And, but it's true. I've got the, one of the littlest words in the Bible and it's opened over 3000 doors around the world. We've been in 29 countries. And right now, uh, I met a gentleman oh, about 30 years ago, uh, the International School of Ministry, Baron Gifferland. Today, every year he was telling me between two to 300,000 people around the world will hear my teachings on the Ministry of Helps in 150 nations, in over 80 different languages, they hear the teaching on the Ministry of Helps. And, uh, and so uh, I remember before the internet, the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, you're going to be on the staff of thousands of churches around the world. And I thought, well, you know, that's going to take a lot of money to do that, you know. But one day I get a phone call from Baron Gifferland, and I've never met, a, met him before. He says, I'm in Tulsa. I'd like to take you to lunch. I thought, hey, free lunch. I'll go. And he says, I, I'm setting up these Bible schools in local churches. And he says, I like to use some of your, uh, your teachings that was on VHS tapes. And I said, sure. And uh, today, uh, it's in a, they're in 150 nations around the world. In wow. 80 different languages. And uh, so, yeah, we have a bo- the books. Uh, we also have them in... Uh, uh, Spanish. Uh, we're working on French coming out because we have uh, 10 teachings that come in what we call the School of Helps. Uh, School of Helps has 10 teachings, uh, 10 30 minute teachings with notes and quizzes and discussion questions. That's in English, it's in Spanish, and just a few weeks ago uh, they converted it into French. Wow. And, uh, and so uh, uh, get a hold of us. Uh, yes, I, uh, I love traveling. I love coming in the churches. Doesn't matter what size they are. I've been in churches that run 30,000 and I just came from a church that had 15 on Sunday morning. Doesn't matter. Uh, you know, uh, I love it. Daniel, I love what I do. I love it. And I love to see people light up and realize you know, if Jesus comes back and I'm in the nursery, he's going to let me in. If Jesus comes back and I'm an usher or I'm out in the parking lot, he's going to let me in. Because we're all valuable. We're all important. And, and I can't leave without doing this. So let me give you one more definition. Uh, this, was, this is becoming pretty famous around the world. It's by a man by the name of Godbay. 
He was a Pentecostal holiness preacher back in the 1800s. And he wrote a commentary on the New Testament. And this is how he defines the ministry of helps. He starts off with the word O-H-O. It's not O. That's how some people, res some people respond to rendering assistance. But he's excited. He starts off, oh, the infinite value of the humble gospel helpers. Thousands of people have no gifts as leaders are number one helpers. How grand revival work moves along when, when red to hot platoons of fire baptized helpers crowd around God's heroic leaders of the embattled hosts. Whoo, that's powerful. <laughs> what a definition for a dirty diaper changer, amen? <laughs> what a definition for an usher. What a definition for those who serve in our outreaches outside of the church, for those who clean the church. Why? Because we're in this together. Amen. Amen. Well, Dr. Buddy Bell, thank you so much for being on the Evangelism Podcast. Uh -huh. I love your ministry and just love your heart for helping pastors and helping build up the helps ministry in the church. God bless you. Amen. Daniel King is on a mission to save one million souls a year, but he can't do it alone. Would you consider sowing a financial seed today? To give, please visit www.kingministries.com.